és nagyon sok szeretettel köszöntöm önöket. Becsak lenne rá lehetőség, hogy minden nyugszanébe belenézzek, és kezdet fogjunk, és meg tudjam köszönni, és el tudjam mondani, hogy nagyra értékelem, hogy önök vasárnap eljöttek a privát idejükbe, és elszánták ezt a napot arra, hogy eljönnek meghallgatni a világ egyik legnevesebb és legjelentőség teljesebb természetvédőjét. Egy icipici információt hadd mondjak, hogy szeretnék önöket megkérni, hogy zavartalan maradhasson az előadás, hogy a mobilokat halkítsák le. Van arra lehetőség, hogy önök készítsenek előadás közben is képeket, vakú nélkül, kérnénk szépen, hogy figyeljenek. És nem is húznám az időt, szólítom a rendezvényünk moderátorát, itt a Vitrai Tamás, a National Geographic Magyarországon az intőszerkesztőjét. Szeretettel köszöntök mindenkit, és uh, azzal kell kezdenem, hála Istennek, hogy boldogan látom, hogy nagy számban vannak itt. Egy gyors kérdés. Emlékszik te valaki, bekiabálással lehet válaszolni nyugodtan, hogy hogy hívták Gerald házi tanítóját? Köszönöm. Hogy hívták a két bátyját? Most így látsz a nővérét. Köszönöm. Választ kaptam minden kétségemre. Önök azért vannak itt velem együtt, mert jól ismerik Gerald Darrell könyveit. Gerald és Lee Darrell könyveit. Úgyhogy amit mondandó vagyok, az pont ezzel kapcsolatos. Én moderátorként vagyok itt, tehát a szerepem csekkéri. De annyit uh, szeretnék elmondani önöknek, hogy ez egy kivételes alkalom. Kivételes alkalom azért, mert olyas valaki fog most előadni önöknek, és olyas valaki tud majd válaszolni a kérdéseikre. És nagyon szeretnék megkérdezni, megkérdeznénk. Olyas valaki, aki, aki talán a világon az egyik legfontosabb képviselője egy. Tulajdonképpen teljesen új, vagy majdnem teljesen új trendnek. És az, ezt a trendet talán mi még nem igazán ismerjük, illetve nem igazán fogtuk föl, hogy létezik, és mennyire fontos. Ez a trend pedig az a trend, hogy az állatkertek szerepe teljesen megváltozott. Magyarországon is. Már hála Istennek, de tulajdonképpen az ember ezt alapvetésnek kezdi tekinteni. Nem fogva föl igazán, hogy mit jelent a, az élvilág sokféleség, illetve csökkenése, illetve a fajvesztés. És az, amit ezek az állatkertek és, és az állatkertek ez kapcsolódó szervezetek el tudnak érni, illetve amit ezek a szervezetek elvégeznek. Lidarrel az egyik, egyik prominens képviselő ennek a törekvésnek, és az előadásában nyilván erről részletesen fognak megbeszélni, tehát nem várnék elébe, nem is ismerem a számokat természetesen, pontosan fejből mind. De azt kérem, hogy legyenek nyitottak és, és tekintsék újdonságnak egy pillanatra, mint azt, amit elmond, abból a szempontból, hogy mennyire nem természetes ez talán még nekünk átlag embereknek, hogy fajok úgy tűnnek el a világból, hogy egy-két kézen megszámlálható egyedük létezik már olykor. És ezt a néhány egyedet állatkertek mentik meg a jövő számára. De ez nem olyan egyszerű, mint ahogy valaha az állatgyűjtő esetében akár az olvasói, könyvolvasó is gondolhatta, hogy oda megyünk, megpróbáljuk megtalálni ezt az állatot, aztán hazavisszük és onnan tudjuk mutogatni. Hanem nagyon sok esetben, és Lierről beszélni fog, gondolom, nagyon sok esetben az állat tartásának módja, az állat befogásának módja, az állat igényei, az állat uh, egészségügyi szükségletei teljesen ismeretlen számunkra, úgy, hogy mindeközben néhány példánya létezik, egyedet létezik már csak a világban, és ezek a szervezetek és ezek az állatkertek, amelyek eltökélték már, hogy elsősorban ezzel foglalkoznak, óriási szakmai munkát végez, 
beszélve, és rendkívüli problémákkal küzdenek meg. Nagyon sok esetben a kutatók tőlük tanulják meg ezeknek a nagyon-nagyon ritka állatoknak a, az élettanát, eltartási módját, megmentésének módját. Tehát ez nem egyszerűen állatkerti kérdés most már, hanem igenis a, a tudomány élvonala és a zoológia talán legfontosabb területe lassan. Még egyszer mondom, nagyon sok fajt még a világból, és nagyon sok múlik azokon, mint Liderrel és alapítványán és a többieken nagyon sok múlik azon, hogy ezek az állatok megmaradhatnak-e még, vagy örökre elvesznek, mint hogy erre már nem is egy példa van. Úgyhogy azt kérem még egyszer zárszóként, hogy így hallgassák őt, és így gondolják végig, mint a szaktában. Nem alapvetésként, nem, egy, nem egyszerűen csak egy szép és nemes vállalkozás beszámolójaként, hanem úgy, ahogy ez valójában látnunk kell, és annak teljes fontosságával. És nagyon kérem Önöket, hogy azért legyenek kérdéseik, mert ismét van ez egy nagyon ritka alkalom, hogy valaki olyan ilyen ellenetet mesélni erről, mint Lidárral. Úgyhogy köszöntsük őt szeretettel. Please welcome Lidárral! such a warm welcome and um, that's what we've experienced ever since we arrived in Hungary for our first time in this wonderful country and thank you so much for your welcome. I'd also like to thank the uh, Jane Goodall Institute for arranging this visit and uh, it's just been fantastic so far. Hannah, Andres and all of their wonderful volunteers, thank you all very much. Now I would like to tell you the story about how one man, my late husband Gerald Darrell, inspired generations of nature conservationists, how his achievements and legacy shaped one of the most influential and effective conservation organizations, Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust, and how Jerry's trust intends to meet the environmental challenges faced by our planet today. Well, Jerry often said that his life began on Corfu, where uh, uh, this was the, the enchanting Greek island where he lived as a boy with his family in the 1930s. And I think a number of you have probably seen the television series. Is that right? How many? How many? Oh, a, wow, a good number. <laughs> the TV company will be very happy at that. Um, as a youngster, Jerry explored every nook and cranny of Corfu, seeking out wildlife from earwigs to eagle owls to turtles and tortoises. This was to nourish his growing passion for wild animals. His family were often involved in his animal adventures, both chaotically and very comically, as we know. Jerry's most enduring, and some say most endearing, book described this magical childhood on the island of Corfu. Well, the family thought that the little boy would outgrow this passion for animals, so what do you think Jerry did when he grew up? He devoted his life to the animal kingdom, of course. And he started out as an animal collector for zoos, traveling in West Africa and South America. But he became unhappy with the profligate attitude of the zoos of the day towards the animals that he would bring back to them. Quite often they would die soon after their arrival. And the zoos would just say, well, there are plenty more where they came from. But of course, Jerry was in a perfect position to know that was not the case and he was determined to have his own zoo, one devoted to conservation of wild species and their habitats. His, his mission was to save species from extinction. Jerry settled his animals in his sister's garden in Bournemouth, and uh, this was just to be a temporary arrangement. Uh, two years later, he still hadn't found a place for his zoo, and the neighbors were getting fairly fed up. Uh, in 1958, though, Jerry visited the biggest of the Channel Islands, Jersey, and he came away with the intention of establishing his zoo there. 
he'd found an ideal spot in the beautiful countryside in the northeast part of the island, and he received the blessing of Jersey's tourism department. So both Jerry and his animals were warmly welcomed by the islanders. In March 1959, Jersey Zoo was opened to the public. And one of Jerry's earliest dreams was to set up a non-profit charitable trust to undertake this mission, including running the zoo on conservation principles. He achieved this in 1963 and chose for the trust's emblem the dodo, the large flightless bird from Mauritius that was driven to extinction by the earliest settlers. To Jerry, the dodo symbolized the fragility and the vulnerability of species when encountering Homo sapiens. And he vowed that no species the trust worked with would follow the dodo to oblivion. In the early days, we concentrated on breeding our animals, and this is our first silverback gorilla, the lovely and charismatic Jambo, who's had more than 180 descendants. Many of them are still living in zoos around the world today, but I've just got to show you Jambo's firstborn, a gorilla called a Sumbo. And a Sumbo is still alive. He's a silverback uh, in uh, a zoo in Germany. We concentrated on studying our animals and disseminating the results. An in-house journal for staff and visiting researchers began in 1964, which is almost an unheard of thing for a zoo to do back in those days. It was called The Dodo and was published annually for nearly 40 years until printing costs became too onerous. However, this journal has resurfaced as an online journal called The Solitaire. And that's the name of another flightless and extinct bird from an island near Mauritius. Now, most zoos of the day would display only impressive, well-known species that were good for their box office, like tigers and elephants. But Jerry believed that every species had an intrinsic value and that no, we humans had no right to drive any of them to extinction. No animal was too obscure or drab for Jerry. His early expeditions to collect animals for breeding targeted what he called the little brown jobs, or LBJs as we call them today. Such creatures as you can see here, the little volcano rabbit from Mexico, which was declining through habitat loss to agriculture. And the smallest member of the pig family, the pygmy hog of Assam in India, which had been, was thought to be extinct but was rediscovered in 1971. Because of the dodo, the island of Mauritius was like a magnet to Jerry. Oops. That's the island of Mauritius, like a magnet to Jerry. <laughs> he first visited the island in the mid 70s, and this is when the trust's efforts in the field really began to uh, take off. He had the good fortune to meet and mentor a young student called Carl Jones, who was burning to save the critically endangered Mauritian species that other conservationists had given up on. This is the, uh, one of those, the Mauritius kestrel, and that had declined to just four birds. With Jerry's encouragement and the trust's support of breeding and release programs, Carl and his team brought this species back from the brink of extinction, and there are now hundreds flying free in the wild in Mauritius. Wilding today, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, are the perfect place to try the ecological restoration experiment was a little speck of an island off the coast of Mauritius called Round Island. This was little more than a, a moonscape because of overgrazing by rabbits, and goats that had been introduced to the island 100 years before. Uh, some native species had already become extinct. Others, like this, well, one of my favorites, the cheeky little Telfair skink, were in steep decline. Well, Carl was again the leader in the effort to fix things, so the rabbits and goats were removed, and almost immediately, the island began to green up. The remaining populations of reptiles and seabirds began to thrive. Well, Carl Jones still works for Durrell. He is our chief scientist. And in 2016, we were thrilled when he was awarded what's considered the Nobel Prize of Conservation, the Indianapolis Prize. And this is for saving more species from extinction than anyone else in the world. And Carl uh, still considers himself one of Jerry's disciples. 
Jerry's second idea was to create a mini university for conservation at Jersey Zoo, and he wanted our first student to come from the island of the dodo. He believed that where breeding endangered species should happen was in their countries of origin by nationals of those countries. Jerry envisioned bringing people from all over the world to Jersey to work with our staff, to work with our animals, uh, and to study the techniques of species recovery that we were developing, go back to their homes and apply what they'd learn. In 1976, Jerry and his PA, John, John Hartley, interviewed this man, Yosef Mungru, in Mauritius. And the story goes that at breakfast on the morning of the interview, John said to Jerry, I know you've had this idea for many, many years, but may I say again, it's not very practical. We don't have any facilities. We don't have a lecture hall. We have uh, no library. We don't even have a residence hall. And Jerry just put his hand in the air and said, details, dear boy, mere details. <laughs> a very typical Jerry. Anyway, Yusuf became the first student of what is now called the Durrell Conservation Academy. And since Yusuf's time, the academy has trained more than 6,000 students from two-thirds of the world's countries. And so the trust to deliver its mission was in the process of developing a conservation toolbox of techniques, including breeding, research, training, restoration of wild populations and habitats. And these activities are all interactive and they sustain each other, and we now deploy them all over the world. So now <clears throat> I'd like to give a brief account of some of our other field programs over the last 40 years. We work with hundreds of species in more than a dozen countries. Now to the west of uh, Mauritius lies the Great Red Island, Madagascar. It's been isolated from other land masses for nearly 100 million years, and so its biota is diverse and unique. Human beings arrived only 2,000 years ago, but have greatly altered natural habitats and caused species extinctions and declines. In the 1970s, when Jerry was thinking about Mauritius, I was doing my field research in Madagascar. And there I am. Uh, I paid much more attention to my pet lemurs than I did to my studies, I can assure you. <laughs> But nevertheless, we married uh, a few years later, and Jerry asked me to start our first species recovery project in Madagascar. This was for uh, a species called the plowshare tortoise, the rarest tortoise in the world, critically endangered and from the dry northwest <coughs> part of Madagascar. So we set up an in-country breeding program. We did field research. We trained nationals as technicians and researchers. And we began releasing captive bred animals to protected areas. But we also, with this project, added another tool to our conservation toolbox, something we called community conservation. And this means engaging and empowering local people to manage their own natural resources. We also work in wetlands conservation in Madagascar. We deal with lakes, rivers, and with marshes, marshes such as the one you see here, in Lake Alatra in the east, which is threatened by conversion to rice fields. We're trying to protect these habitats to build up depleted populations of their flagship species, such as the, this lemur, the Alatran gentle lemur, which is the only marsh-dwelling primate. There's also uh, the rarest duck in the world, called the Madagascar potchard. There are only 20 left in the wild. And one of my favorites, the Madagascar big-headed turtle. And for the turtle and the duck, we've also been breeding them in Madagascar and releasing them into protected areas. The western dry forests of Madagascar, they're now seriously threatened by rapid clearance for agriculture, the latest scheme being to um, clear the forest to plant peanuts to ex export peanut oil to China. They're home to many, many unique species. <coughs> Uh, the, the carnivore you, you see here on the left, the elegant uh, fossa, uh, is an extraordinary creature. It's still fairly widespread, but declining. But the three species you see on the right are found only in intact forest in the hardest hit area of the West. We're breeding them, studying them, and assisting local communities to protect and restore their forest. Now to the Caribbean, Caribbean islands. We've been working there 
for many years, first with this species, the St. Lucia parrot. Uh, this was from the mid-70s. It was down to just a few hundred individuals. Now, thanks to a widespread education and protection program, there are about 2,000 uh, wild parrots flying free in St. Lucia. In 1995, the island of Montserrat uh, had, had a quiescent volcano, and uh, 1995 had been quiet for 200 years, but that's the year the volcano erupted, endangering life in them on the island. The government asked us to step in to see if we could undertake breeding trials back in Jersey for an endemic, iconic species called the mountain chicken, in case the volcano situation got, uh, got worse. And the mountain chicken, as you just saw, was a great big frog. <laughs> um, um, I mean a big frog, and you can tell from this picture here. Now that is a large frog. And do you all recognize the man on the left? A lot of you, well, it's John Cleese, who is this famous um, British comedian. And uh, the man holding the mountain chicken was our, our head of herpetology, Gerardo Garcia, who's now head at uh, Chester Zoo in the UK. Well, we were the first ever to breed this species, but something even worse than the volcano happened. Something called chytrid fungus, which is wiping out amphibians globally, arrived in Montserrat in 2009. We and our partners have been battling against this fungus ever since uh, with various experiments to try to cure frogs using fungicidal baths. This is in the field, giving them little baths in the field. And now to alter the habitat slightly, just slightly, but to produce conditions that are unfavorable to the fungus. That is work in progress. Now the mammalian species of the Caribbean, 90% of those mammals, uh, mammal species have disappeared, mainly due to the effects of invasive species released by human beings. In uh, the huge island of Hispaniola, though there are a few species left, and we've done initial field work for two of them, uh, on the left is a rodent called a hutia, uh, and on the right is a primitive insectivore, uh, like a shrew, uh, called a selenodon. And our staff fondly call it the Selene Dion. <laughs> so that's early initial field work for those species. Now, I know it sounds like we're a bit mad about islands, which of course we are, but we don't only work in islands. For many years we've been working with these little monkeys uh, of South America in the rainforests of eastern Brazil. And it's here that the wild habitats are so fragmented into tiny pockets of forests uh, where the animals live, they're as isolated as they would be if they lived on islands. These are the lion tamarins. On the left is golden lion tamarin. On the right, something called a black lion tamarin. Uh, both species have been bred in Jersey and been part of release back to the wild programs. But what will most likely save the day for these species is the planting of tree corridors to link up those islands of forest. We've been working with a Brazilian NGO, which is run by two of our uh, graduates from our academy, and with the local community to create these forest corridors. Now, another continental situation, and our old friend the pygmy hog from Assam. From the only known wild population, the one that was rediscovered in 1971, we took animals for breeding, and we've released the progeny into two <coughs> other sites, uh, fragments of the former extensive grasslands, called the terai grasslands, that run the length of the Himalayan lowlands. These populations are becoming established, and just two years ago, we released our 100th captive-bred pygmy hog. So what's happening back on our home island of Jersey? Well, we know conservation begins in your own back garden. Uh, we've been working with the National Trust and the Environment Department of our government to restore this species. This is called the red-billed chuff, to restore the chuff and its cliffside habitat. Now, it's still a common species in Eastern Europe. I imagine you have some here. I don't really know. Um, but it is very rare in Western Europe, and it died out in Jersey over 100 years ago because of change of habitats, uh, uh, change in land use, and persecution. But now local people in Jersey are solidly behind the project, and we've been releasing captive bred chuffs since 2013. There are now nearly 50 chuffs flying free in Jersey, more than half of which have hatched in the wild. 
And this uh, little group of chuffs, you don't call it a flock of chuffs, you call it a chattering of chuffs, <laughs> because that's what they do when they're all together foraging on the ground. They just chitter chatter to each other. Beautiful, beautiful bird. Three miles to the east of the release site, as the chuff flies, is Jersey Zoo itself. And here we are concentrating on Jerry's little brown jobs. So at the top there uh, is a mountain chicken, but we're working with many other amphibians because of this threat, horrible threat of the chytrid fungus. We work with passerine birds, that is the small little perching birds that have been neglected by most zoos. And of course with the small monkeys of South America that are so threatened by land conversion, habitat fragmentation, and as we now know by forest fires. Now at this point, I would like to digress slightly and tell you about a series of talks I participated in a few years ago. It was called The Tribal Elders, and it was hosted by the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. Two of the elders were my heroes. There is your founder, founder of JGI, uh, Jane Goodall, uh, who gave the inaugural lecture of Tribal Elders, and our beloved patron, uh, Her Royal Highness Princess Anne, the Princess Royal. Being asked to participate in this lecture series reminded me of the words attributed to Sir Isaac Newton. He said, If I have seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. This was written in 1676, but it can be traced back to a cleric called Bernard of Chartres in the 12th century. And Bernard of Chartres was comparing uh, the scholars of his day to the ancients, to the ancient Greek and Roman scholars. So if I have seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. So what have we seen from the sho shoulders of those giants, like uh, Jane Goodall and Princess Anne? Well, all of the tribal elders have followed a common theme, and it's that of ecological connections or ecological networks. Her Royal Highness reminded us that each species is an essential part of nature's jigsaw, or of the planet's arc, if you like. Each has a role to play, however obscure the species, however modest the role. If you remove one, another may step in, and the strength of the network remains. But if you remove several species, and if the connection starts to weaken and disappear, uh, the network itself is compromised, and there can come a tipping point at which it can no longer compensate for change. We say it's no longer resilient, and there can be a cascade of extinctions and catastrophic collapse of the system. Gerald Durrell expressed this succinctly when he said in 1972, the world is as delicate and as complicated as a spider's web. Touch one strand and you send shudders running through all the other strands. But we're not just touching the web, we are tearing great holes in it. But the species that make those connections in the web are themselves made up of populations. And the populations are made up of individuals. Therefore, each individual, as Jane Goodall has said, can make a difference. She talked about the hands-on activities of her Roots and Shoots children's groups, which now comprise 150,000 members in about 140 countries around the world. Examples of other activist groups in which individuals have collectively had a great impact are Greenpeace. Greenpeace has compelled, compelled the giant Nestle Corporation to stop using palm oil. And fair trade, fair trade persuades millions of consumers around the world to purchase socially and environmentally benign products. These positive results can, however, appear to be overwhelmed by the many negative factors we're all aware of today. The disastrous impacts of habitat degradation and loss, the insidious impact of human-induced climate change, the direct impacts of the commercial exploitation of species, legal and illegal, and the ever-present threat of invasive species. This is something called a brown tree snake from Australia and uh, some South Pacific islands. It was accidentally introduced to the island of Guam in the Western Pacific, and within 20 years it has caused the extinction of the birds and lizards of the forests of Guam and has terrorized the human population. Gerald Durrell once said, 
that the destruction of nature proceeds at the speed of an Exocet missile, whereas conservation of nature progresses at the pace of a donkey and cart. But there's one important thing to remember. A concern for nature is found across cultures, professions, classes, and ages. Maybe it's weaker in some groups and more profound in others, but because it crosses the usual barriers that set humans apart from each other, I believe that concern for nature is a universal principle, which is driven by the phenomenon of the connectedness among all living things, whether it's something uh, biologically fundamental, like sharing the same DNA, or even indeed something more spiritual. Surely, if the concern for nature is ubiquitous, and nature is comprised of connections, then the force arising from the combined efforts of individuals can, as Jane Goodall has said, change things for the better. Gerald Darrell passed away in 1995, and the obituaries and the letters that uh, I received all hailed him as an icon of nature conservation of the 20th century. It seemed as if people were waking up to his message that biodiversity, the great variety of animals and plants and ecosystems, was precious to all of us and that we should all do our utmost to protect it. In 1999, I was delighted to give my blessing to the renaming of the trust in honor of Gerald Durrell. Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust. And we literally wrote the mission in stone. That's the simplest but most powerful mission statement I know of, saving species from extinction. It's just four words, but we do what it says. Since Jerry passed away, the trust has gone from strength to strength, and our record for saving species from extinction is second to none. Why is this we're so successful? I think it has... uh, something to do with our focus on species. That has enormous ramifications. I'd like to call it the iceberg effect. So you see there, the saving of the species is the tip of the iceberg. But there's so many other things that happen. We save habitats, we gain knowledge, we transfer skills, we train and employ staff and get volunteers behind us, and we get people reconnected with nature. We also owe our success to something I like to call the bedrock effect, because the principles and values instilled by Gerald Durrell from the beginning underpin everything we do. And these include the fact that we work with all animals, not just the big box office species, but the little brown jobs as well. We know that conservation requires a long-term commitment. We've been working in Mauritius for more than 40 years, and we'll be there for another 100. We know that conservation is all about people, whether it's your own staff, your graduates, your volunteers, or the local communities. But just how successful are we? Can you actually quantify it? Well, our scientists have prepared, uh, prepared this graph a few years ago, and it shows how the fortunes of Durrell species have changed over time. The vertical axis is a measure of the likelihood of species survival, so going up is good towards survival, going down is very bad. The blue line is a plot of the species that Durrell has worked with. Clearly, their situation is improving. Then our science guys did something they called a counterfactual analysis. What would have happened to those species if Durrell had not intervened with its conservation actions? Well, clearly, they would have been headed towards extinction. In 2017, the Trust unveiled a new conservation strategy. Inspired by Gerald Durrell's legacy, it will guide us until 2025. We call it Rewild Our World. It remains faithful to the mission of our founder to save species from extinction. But under the banner of rewilding, we've come to appreciate its true scope, not only to save species, but to restore ecosystems in the sense of rebuilding them functionally that is reconnecting the broken ecological links. This aspect of the strategy sees us active in 10 field sites around the world. We've been working in most of these places already, some for many years, as I've been talking about earlier. Leading the way is the ongoing effort on Round Island. Having removed the invasive rabbits and goats 
and reverse the decline of native species, we're now restoring missing species, or at least their ecological functions. The large herbivores of Round Island, the Mauritius giant tortoises, had become extinct. But by introducing an ecological replacement, which is the Aldabra giant tortoise in this case, we're witnessing a remarkable recovery of native plants. This is due to the Aldabra spreading the seeds of the native plants and trampling and eating the exotic plants that compete with the natives. So a broken connection in the Round Island ecosystem is being mended. Now an equally vital part of the strategy involves the other sort of connection I mentioned, that is the concern that people have for nature and the connection between them. We will work to rebuild the links between people and nature. Those links that Jerry taught us about through his uh, wonderful books and by starting a special zoo more than 60 years ago. So our zoo will increasingly blur the boundaries between animals and people. Our community conservation work at the rewilding sites will emphasize the ecological links between people, um, uh, people, nature, and the well-being of all. We firmly believe that reconnecting people with nature will help drive the changes needed to protect and restore the natural world. We aim to have made good progress on the strategy by the year 2025, it's a very special year for us, because Gerald Dole would have been 100 years old. We intend to have 10 sites being actively rewilded. With our partners, we intend to have 100 threatened species on, well on the road to recovery, 500 species in projects that are doing well, and also intend to have helped a million people become better connected to nature. So this is Jerry's legacy, not surprisingly. It owes much to islands. It was Corfu that kindled Jerry's devotion to the natural world and his understanding of the links between people and nature. Jersey sustained Jerry's first tangible ideas for protecting nature. Mauritius gave full rein to his vision that it's possible to learn from our mistakes and to rectify them, that it's indeed possible to repair the ecological disruptions caused by our own species. If islands can be construed as microcosms of the wider world, and ecological successes on islands are demonstrable at the levels of species, ecosystems, and human communities, then there is hope for the wider planet. But what fundamentally inspired Jerry himself? What led him to inspire others in turn? Well, I think this is best expressed by the words I had put on the granite stone where his ashes are buried in the grounds of Jersey Zoo. And I'd like to read those out to you now. They say, the beauty and genius of a work of art may be reconceived, though its first material expression be destroyed. A vanished harmony may yet again inspire the composer. But when the last individual of a race of living beings breathes no more, another heaven and another earth must pass before such a one can be again. So I thank you all very much for listening, and I'm very happy to take the questions. Thank you.
supper tonight. I don't know. If you Thank you all very much for coming. I, I enjoyed it. Bye-bye.